Okay, we're recording, so we're ready for you, Brent. Okay. Hey, I wanted to welcome everybody to a wonderful morning here with Dr. Leo Rouse. So um, we're really grateful that he can spend some time with us. Uh, I consider him a good friend. He's been um, a little bit of a mentor to me. He's an amazing individual. I think one of the virtues, if you remember when Dr. Hayden was here, talked about humility and uh, Dr. Ross definitely for all the accomplishments that he's had over his career is very humble. I just wanted to kind of let you know a few things that he does and currently is doing. So Dr. Ross serves currently as the past president of the American College of Dentists. And he's the current president of the American College of Dentists Foundation, which is a little bit different. He's a professor and Dean Emeritus of the Howard University College of Dentistry. And he graduated in 1973 from Howard University College of Dentistry. He's uh, retired as a colonel in the U.S. Army Dental Corps in 1997 with a final assignment as a commander of U.S. Army Dental Command. He served as a staff member and a senior scholar in residence, American Dental Education Association. He's the past chair of the Adia Geis Foundation Advisory Committee liaison to the IDEA Council of Deans, and most recently an IDEA Consultant Om Ombudsman. In March of 2010, and I remember when he was installed in this, uh, Dr. Rouse was elected president-elect of IDEA, and if I'm not mistaken, you were elected right after Dr. Hunt, if I'm not mistaken, and I can right after Dr. Dr. Andrew. correct that if I'm wrong. Um, he uh, was the first African-American president of IDEA and when he was installed in March of 2011. Dr. Rouse presently serves on a lot of boards, including the Board of Regents of Uniformed Services, University of Health Sciences, the Board of Advisors, University of Pittsburgh School of Dental Medicine, and the Board of Advisors of Meharry Medical College. There's three pertinent awards that he has received from IDEA, including the 2017 IDEA Distinguished Service Award, the 2009 ADEA Presidential Citation, and the 2015 and 19 ADEA Chairman of the Board Citation. And he just recently received a 2020 Distinguished Service Award from the American Dental Association. And all amazing accomplishments. He has so much more to tell about his career. He probably won't get into everything, but I'm going to leave the time with him to go over uh, the things that we've talked about. I think you will find it very interesting, very enlightening, and very forward-thinking. So, uh, Dr. Rouse, it's all yours now. Hey, good, good morning, uh, Dean Smith. Brad, thank you so very much, and good morning to your outstanding student body at Midwestern University in Phoenix. It is good to be with you all this morning, and uh, I want to thank Dr. Dodell. Uh, David has done a remarkable job getting me set up. I'm, I'm a Zoom person. I have been using Zoom for the last two years since the pandemic. And uh, I have Zoomitis, so I have a special set of glasses that I use when I'm on my computers. And more importantly, uh, this morning, it's all about you. It's all about you. And, and I thank you, Brad, for the wonderful introduction. You know, yes, I've served in Uncle Sam's Army, and I, I really got to tell you, everything I've learned about the leadership is from the U.S. Army Medical System, and I've had opportunity and very fortunate to be a dean of a dental school. And so I've been truly blessed for the last 49 years since I've been out of dental school, and uh, I got to tell you, uh, we have a lot to talk about this morning, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, I'm so glad you're here. And if you have any questions, go hold for the Q&A, but more importantly, uh, I have an outline, and I like to talk. I'm not using any slides today. Uh, Dr. Dodell and I worked to see initially two weeks ago uh, to get things set up, but there are some glitches as anything else in the world, but it's all good. Uh, let me just tell you what my theme is for today, and this is important. This is my theme. My theme is know thyself. Know who you are. And I will get more into that a little later because it's so important that we kind of talk about ourselves. So I'm going to cover the following topics. I'm going to talk about leadership. I'm going to talk about ethics. 
I'm going to talk about mentorship. I'm going to discuss professionalism. I'm going to discuss health equity. I'm going to also talk about DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And then we're going to talk about person-centered care. And I know at your institution, you all are very fortunate to have a great faculty and a fantastic dean. I've known Dean Smith for many years. And I got yesterday, I want to do a shout out because I got a nice email from Dr. David Hancock. And I think Dr. Hancock, Professor Hancock, is your ethics teacher and uh, he's an American College fellow. As many of the faculty are at Midwestern. And it was good to hear from him. And we, it reminded me of when we first met a few years ago. But more importantly, uh, you're, you're fortunate. Now, uh, I need to ask you, uh, and I should have asked David yesterday, uh, Brad, do you all have a, uh, a SPIA chapter at uh, Midwestern? Dean Smith? Okay. Well, if, if we can communicate that back to me, that would be great. SPIA yeah. chapter is Student Professional Ethics Association. It's a national organization. But uh, I do I do hope you do have one there. So let me give you some breaking news, colleagues. And I refer to you as colleagues because I do consider you guys colleagues. You know, ladies and gentlemen, you are our colleagues in the health profession. And so I refer to you as colleagues. Just this morning, uh, I got a email from the American Dental Association, which I get every morning. It's the morning news. And interesting enough, um, this morning's paper talked about the program at the North Dakota School of Medicine and Health Sciences. And what they're doing is they're launching a free virtual lecture series in January to train state dental providers to incorporate certain primary care services, such as blood pressure screening and discussions of obesity and diabetes during patient visits. What was kind of missing from this was the reverse. Let's also talk about oral health and oral health diseases and things of that nature, so we kind of flip the screen. But what I'm happy about is that our medical colleagues are basically looking at this whole notion person-centered care, and uh, it affects the folks in North Carolina, the rural community, the indigenous population, et cetera. So I want to share it with you this morning as a start. So I'm going to use a lot of quotes. Uh, I've had many mentors, uh, both in the military and out of the military, and I'm going to start with uh, a quote from one of my major mentors. General Colin Powell, I think many of you may know him. Uh, he passed away last month. He was a four-star chairman of the Board of uh, Joint Chiefs of Staff, as well as a Secretary of State, and also one of my mentors when I was in the Army War College. I got to really reacquaint myself with General Powell. And when I became the dean at Howard University, General Powell was on the Board of Trustees. And there's a photograph that I could have shown you on this, if you could do the camera, but General Powell, I uh, got to know him in the early 2000s after I became a dean, and uh, we reflected back on our military experiences. But I like to always quote General Powell when it comes to leadership. Leadership, colleagues, is all about people. It's not about organizations. It's not about plans. It is not about strategies. It is all about people motivating people to get the job done. You have to be people-centered, and we'll talk about person-centered care a little later, but I want to share one more quote from General Powell. You know you're a good leader when people follow you out of curiosity, and that's important. And so. As I spoke with Dr. Donnell last week, I learned, and I know uh, I knew the previous dean prior to Brad, that your school has a wonderful program where the D4s and D3s are in a mentor-mentee relationship. And 
And I think that is so important because what it allows you to do is to have a continuity of patient care as the D4s graduate and the D3s become D4s and it continues on from there. That to me is fantastic. And I want to commend all of you who participate in that process because we get into a discussion about diversity, equity, and inclusion, DEI, we're going to talk about mentors and mentees and what you can do as a member of the healthcare profession to assist your institution, Midwest, and, and others as a mentor to facilitate uh, your admissions and recruitment activities for future dentists, those who will come behind you to replace you. But I want to jump into ethics, and I know that Dr. Hancock has probably already covered this with you guys and ladies. But there are five principles of ethics, the American Dental Association. And I just wanted to say this reminder, I know you know this, but as a reminder, just to get us all on the same sheet of music, patient autonomy, the self-government, governance aspect. We as dentists and you as dental students and future dentists has a duty to respect the patient's rights. Non-maleficence, do no harm. The dentist has a duty to refrain from harming the patient. That is so important. As we talk about health equity and health inequality during these pandemic time, okay? Beneficence, do good. The dentist has a duty to promote the patient's welfare. As you do so well, at the Midwestern University Dental Institute, okay? Justice, simply fairness. The dentist has a duty to treat people fairly, to treat people fairly. And the last, or the fifth, is verac veracity. Truthfulness, just simply truthfulness. We have the duty to communicate truthfully with our patients. And I will talk more about that a little later, colleagues, because I know as students, and you as students who are involved in institution that's well, well, the curriculum is fantastic at your school. And I know just from Dr. Hancock, your ethics program is out of sight because you use a lot of the ethical dilemmas from the American College of Dentists. And I know you are familiar with what I'm talking about. So, you know, I just get so excited when I talk about leadership because I'm a people person. I wish I could have been there in person in Phoenix with you folks and Dean Smith and your wonderful faculty. But we're doing it virtually and actually I'm doing it by speaker, unfortunately, but I hope you get the points that I'm making to you colleagues because it's so important that you understand where we're going with this discussion, and it's very important. So um, we talked about leadership. We talked about ethics, and, and I don't want to beat that drum too hard, but I want to go into a discussion now about professionalism. And I think you all know the definition of professionalism. You know, as healthcare providers, we must always conduct ourselves in a professional manner. We're given the right to state licenses to treat patients. Even though we have gone through the certification process and the credentialing process to earn a license, you must also maintain a professional, if you will, demeanor or professional mantra that your patients will respect you and your community will respect you. So I'm going to uh, focus on another quick thing. And again, part of my discussion with you today to sort of get you, to get you prepared for this discussion later on personal incentive care and uh, on the topic of uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And again, 
please forgive me. I threw a lot of quotes out. Uh, I, I do it intentionally because these men uh, and women that I know, I've worked with, uh, have been really mentors to me and have allowed me to do what I do well in terms of sharing information. And that's what we're doing is sharing information with you. I would hope that some of you have read or have been informed about the 2000 document on oral health in America, public by then Surgeon General David Satcher. And in 2000, we had not had any discussion at all prior to that time of the, the value of caries and caries being a number one disease of children or how do we integrate oral health and total health, which I know you are fully aware of. That is so important. This is the foundation of what we do today, trying to facilitate a conversation as the folks are doing in North Dakota at the medical school of bringing in dentists to kind of collaborate on those medical exams that are done that they want to help us understand. But we already know this, but what's wrong with having the collaboration and the partnership and relationship? You're talking about individuals who have diabetes. I think it's good to know that we already know as dental students and dentists, we know the effect of diabetes on the periodontia. It's not rocket science. We know what happens there. We know about hypertension. We know about metastatic cancer. We know about cancer that metastasizes from remote sites into the oral cavity. And this is why we are so concerned about doing a full oral exam at the same time, doing a complete medical history of our patient. I do remember when I was a dental student, I started dental school in 1969, so I'm aging myself. But I will tell you, the first thing I heard the dean then say, the last thing we look at in a patient is his or her teeth. We do a complete medical history. We do a full exam. And that was years ago. And here we are now talking about how do we integrate primary care with oral health care. And there are schools like you folks do around the country that are teaching that particularly comes to interprofessional education, IPE. What Brad did not share with you, Dean Smith, in 2008, I served on the expert panel along with other healthcare members, physicians, osteopathic, allopathic, nurse practitioners, public health members of the community, uh, social workers, and we were working on the core competencies to facilitate interprofessional education. And through those competencies, we talked about how do we create an environment where we can just talk with each other, not to, but with each other, about total health. So my first story I'm going to share with you, and I'm not sure whether you all know this, but February 27th, 2007, a young male, 12 years of age, a special needs student in a special needs high school in my state of Maryland, went to a clinician with an acute episode. He had an acute carious lesion that had pulpitis, in this case, irreversible pulpitis. And he went to this clinician, and believe it or not, the young man was denied dental care. And why was he denied dental care? Well, he was denied dental care because he was no longer Medicaid eligible. And the individual, the practitioner, could not find it in his or her heart to just basically treat the tooth from a gratis point of view. You're talking about caring and trying not to do the wrong thing. You talk about the values of veracity and beneficence and so forth, the ethical components that you learn every day and hear about in your school, and hopefully you practice those things with your patients. So make a long story short, 
this young man, the MIT driver, literally was denied care, went to the National Children's Medical Center in Washington, D.C. He got very sick from a karyogenic lesion. That bacteria migrated to his brain, and he died of a brain abscess. And simple procedure, perhaps maybe a little pulpectomy, perhaps maybe even an extraction, which wasn't done. And I do remember getting a phone call from then Congressman Elijah Cummins, who passed away a couple of years ago, Congressman from Baltimore. And I'm in my office, and he says to me, Dean, I do hope that you and your dean colleagues are teaching young people the value of community service, the value of giving to those who no longer have the insurance or the access to care, et cetera. And I know you folks in Midwestern understand what I'm talking about. So I got a little chewed out by a congressman. And he and Senator Ben Cardin from Maryland, they started the Oral Health Caucus. And from that caucus, they got involved with the state of Maryland and the federal government to facilitate the CHIPS program, which is the Children's Health Insurance Program. And in this case of Maryland, the S-CHIP program, the state children's health insurance program. I tell you that story because there's a value to when someone comes into your practice or into your clinic, and they're seeking health care, and all you can do is concern yourself about the dollar. This is going to make money. This will be successful financially. But this is about heart. I think some of you are participants in, in the mom program, you know, Missions of Mercy uh, for your communities. If not, it's a great thing that's happening around the country. I think some of you may be involved with veterans, veterans who may come to Midwestern University Still Institute because they know they're going to get double the type of care from a good student and from a great faculty member. So many schools are now migrating towards treating veterans in their communities. And I know there are a lot of veterans in the Phoenix community. So it's important that I tell you that story because it's about caring. It's about allowing yourself to give to someone. You know, we talk about access to care almost on a daily basis. We talk about who's providing the care, et cetera. And I get so excited when I hear about programs where there are mentors and mentees, such as your D4 and D3 program, where the patient continuity is not dropped as the senior leaves and the new senior, new D4 comes in. That, to me, is phenomenal. So, you know, I asked you earlier about professionalism. I just have a quick, I have a quick phrase for that that I use. Professionalism is simply doing one's job, doing one's job with skill, competencies, ethics, and courtesy. Skills, competencies, ethics, and courtesy. Think about that. Because oftentimes we sort of forget about that individual who's in our dental chair or in our operatory or in our clinical space. That that individual is there because they assume and they know because you are licensed that you are competent ethical, and courteous. And I'll add another term, empathy. Empathy. That's why I said earlier, my theme, know thyself. Know who you are. It's so important. You know, part of the accreditation process is this humanistic criteria, humanistic standard. Okay, and I know you're well aware of that. And sometimes we don't practice humanism. We we talk about it, and 
we go into a whole different corridor as if we had blinders on. That's so important. So professionalism, colleagues, ethics, and leadership, your title is all together, and you have an individual, in your case, future clinicians, future dentists, who literally are in a whole different zone when it comes to healthcare delivery. Now, I'm going to use another quote from Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And I think you all know this, and you may have heard it, you may have read it. Of all the forms of inequality, of all the forms of inequality, injustice in healthcare is the most shocking and inhumane. Think about that. Injustice in healthcare is the most shocking and inhumane. I go back to the 12 year old, DMRT driver. You think about that in terms of what Dr. King was talking about way back in 1966. And I got to tell you, that sticks with me. I use it in every presentation that I'm invited to present, whether I'm talking about healthcare, I'm talking about oral healthcare, I'm talking about integrated healthcare. I bring it up because it's a reminder to me as a health care provider that I must look at the person as a person who's there to see me, and in your case, there to see you because of your skill set, because of your professionalism, because of your competency, because of your ethics, and the fact that you're just a courteous individual who cares about people. We swing back to leadership again, all right? And so I share it with you because it's so important. You know, another one of my great quotes from Dr. King, and I use this all the time, life's most persistent and urgent question is, now think about this now, life's most persistent and urgent question is, what are you doing for others? Now think about that. Some of you are not even born when Dr. King was alive and doing his thing as a civil rights activist. But years ago, he focused on just the most important thing of making sure everybody gets quality health care. Quality health care. And when you think about that, when someone's in your dental chair, you know who you are. But do you really know who you are? We won't get into a discussion about unconscious or conscious bias or implicit or explicit bias, intersexuality. We won't get into those discussions, but they'll come up during some other comments. Because I want you to think about these things because you are the provider. I had a wonderful tour of duty. I use that term as the president-elect and the president of the American College of Dentists. Even though we did everything virtually, I didn't do, I couldn't travel a lot because of the you know, pandemic, but I must tell you, I learned a lot about what students are doing as I spoke to student groups around the country. And ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, I am so, so happy to tell you that what I hear and what I've seen for, from our young students, regardless of the pandemic and what we went through in terms of virtual learning, missing out on some clinical activities during the last 20 months, it was painful. Another quick set for you for me, and I'll bring it up now because I know Dean Smith and his faculty are preparing you well. And I know during the pandemic, I got so upset when we were not considered as essential, as essential providers. And I really took, you know, the governor of our state in Maryland to task and the county execs, et cetera, and said, you know, we, we have dentists. We have to close their practices. We have schools that have wonderful clinics that have become safety nets for a lot of the communities they reside in. 
and they can't even do the immunization or testing. Well, some of the great states and governors around the country got engaged and they changed that. Uh, I know that some of you, uh, when you graduate, whether you take the REV or the APEX or the edX, edX examination, uh, a live patient that they can no longer part of the process. I've been involved in that since I was a freshman dental student. Uh, the idea of having to go through so many exams for different states, and then we regionalized that, and now we're sort of nationalized. But to eliminate that, which the folks from ASDA and ADIR, our student chapters, work so diligently to transform. And that's important. So again, another one of those points in life, and I'm not a politician, but I pay very close attention to those things that I think will affect the profession. And I love the profession of dentistry. And I know you do also. That's why you're at Midwestern. So quick segue, advocacy. Advocacy. And I'm quite sure many of you were involved with your dean and faculty and your state dental associations in Arizona related to ensuring that, well, we can get immunization. Well, we can now do testing for COVID-19, because we are essential. We are essential. And during my military career, I spent 28 plus years in the military and got involved in several conflicts. You know what conflicts means. And in conflicts, as a dentist, we don't do class twos at periodical scaling on the battlefield. We do tri triage. And I used that argument with our state representatives here in Maryland and leadership in Maryland as to dentists have done millions of injections. We do intraoral injections. We've done IV sedations. We've had anesthesia training, yada, yada, yada. And they said, well, you know, we, you know, you don't understand the big picture. You have doctors. That's what the DMD or DDS stands for. They're doctors. They're not technicians. And while I'm saying this to you, colleagues, don't let anyone make the assumption that you are a technician. You are a fully vetted, well-trained health care provider. And as an advocate, you need to be continuously advocating for your profession to make sure that people realize. This is why the folks at North Dakota this morning was announcing the ADA News are bringing their dental colleagues in under some funding to sort of get to know what they do to integrate them about the value of patient screening for diabetes, everything else that's going on. So it's a wonderful relationship. And so I do a lecture on the two C's. The two C's stands for collaboration and communication. When we communicate with each other, we're able to collaborate and make things happen. Okay, another lecture called the two E's, exposure and experience. I've had a wealth of exposures, which have given me tons of experiences. And some of those exposures were not great either, but they taught me how to use that to create an experience. And I respect Brad Smith. I got to tell you, you have a remarkable dean. And because I know his compassion for the profession. I knew the previous dean prior to that to Brad very well also. He came from Tennessee. And we always talk about his plan for Midwestern, his vision for Midwestern. You know, he had a vision. And, and Brad is continuing that vision, but adding his own vision to what you are learning to make sure that you are a competent, well-trained, skilled, and courteous health care provider. And for that, you know, I, I have to always, you know, pay homage to your dean because Brad's, Brad's one of those cool guys who knows how to get stuff done. And I happened to meet Dr. Dowdell last week for last, and I feel the same way about David. So I thank you very much for that. I'm going to go into a second story. And of course, these are building blocks, colleagues. The second story is about, and you may have heard about her back in December of last year, 
Her name is Dr. Susan Moore. Dr. Moore is an African American, 2002, University of Michigan Medical School graduate. She died in December of last year, this time last year, after battling with COVID-19 at a hospital in Indiana, a hospital, by the way, where she practiced. You may know the story. She published a video about her care as an inpatient on Facebook. Why do I tell you this? She experienced unequal treatment or racial disparities in healthcare because of her race. She has sarcoidosis, which you know is an inflammatory disease that attacks the lungs. What I'm telling you though is that health disparities are preventable differences in the burden of disease, injury, violence, and in opportunities to achieve optimal health experience by socially disadvantaged racial, ethics, and other population groups and cultures. We all know that these disparities are unjust, unfair, and directly relate to the historical and current unequal distribution of social, political, economic, and environmental advantages. Why do I tell you this story? Think about you as a future dentist out in the community, and regardless of the person's ethnicity, gender, sexual preferences, whatever the case might be, always back to our theme, know who you are, know thyself. And what I'm saying here is she was treated by a peer a physician, happened to be a white physician, who made the assumption that Dr. Moore was just wanting drugs as if someone from the street who comes in, regardless of what the ethnicity is, there are folks we know who abuse opioids and folks who abuse drugs, et cetera. But the point is, he made a dispassionate decision about her health care and forgot about her being in that bed as an inpatient and one of his peers. Now, I'm not going to talk about systemic racism in this conversation. I'm not going to do that. We don't do that, okay? But the important thing is that she literally had the right to let the world know how she was being treated. And she died. She died of COVID-19, secondary to a chronic illness of sarcoidosis. Just like General Colin Powell, my mentor, former leader, and friend, died at Walter Reed here in Bethesda, Maryland. COVID-19, he had a chronic illness of multiple myeloma, which is a blood disease, blood cancer. And so you think about the person. This is why we're talking about person-centered care in a few minutes. You think about the person. That person is a human who is there to seek and get the best health care that he or she can receive. And I think it's important that you all understand that, okay? You know, um, Dr. King also said, and I, I, I love to reference Dr. King because not only is he a person that I happen to know when I was a little boy, when Dr. King came to D.C. and did the I Have a Dream speech, the 60s, back in the 60s, rather, and I was at Howard University as an undergrad when he died, when he was assassinated in, uh, in Memphis, he always say the time is always right to do what is right now more than ever. Now think about what you've read and seen and heard over the last several years related to the pandemic and the inequality of healthcare and people who are refusing to get vaccinated. That's not a discussion for me 
That's a personal decision. Well, we are professionals and we help you provide this, okay? It is crucial, even now more than ever, that we as a community, a nation, take a stand and be willing and able to do what is right toward and for each other. Uh, Brad knows this, Dean Smith knows this. I have an expression, I always say it, do the right thing, always right the first time, if that's possible. That's been a mantra of mine since I was in the military years ago. And here Dr. King is saying, always be willing to take a stand and be able to do the right thing toward and for each other. That's what community is all about. This is back to what you do at Midwestern with your D4, D3 mentor, mentee relationship. You're, you're, you're preparing each other and that patient that you're working with, you're transferring a patient continuity. I just love that. I just truly love that. And it's fantastic. And you take that with you when you leave Midwestern, whether you go into a residency program, whether they go into a private practice, go to an Indian reservation, go to a community health clinic, go into a family qualified health clinic, you take that with you because that's so, so, so important. And, you know, I always say this to students and faculty when I have opportunity to speak with them. I always say, you know, well, I'm going to ask you a question. What are you doing for others? What are you doing for others? And, and that's so important. So we, we've talked about ethics. We, we talked about leadership. We, we got into a discussion about mentorship. And I got a, I got a feeling that uh, Dean Smith and his faculty out there at Midwest, you, you guys are phenomenal, phenomenal individuals when it comes to mentorship. And that's so important. And it helps the university, that helps your community, that helps you as an individual. It's so important. Now, I want to switch down to our, another quick topic, and, and it's not to bore you, and I hope you're not getting bored, but I can talk forever. But this is important to me, and it, it occurred to me during the pandemic. And before I go into that discussion, I think some of you may realize now, because of what's going on now with the Omicron variant that's out, I was watching the news last night, and I was reading stuff in the New York Times newspaper uh, this morning, the number of nurses and healthcare providers that are leaving their profession because they're feeling burned out and worried about their well-being and the folks that are coming into the hospital who they know done well, could have, should have been vaccinated, it's not my discussion point for today. You all know the conversation. But we're losing men and women who have committed and dedicated their lives to helping people, helping others, helping the communities. And sometimes, colleagues, I get a little passionate about this because I know a ton of nurses, nurse practitioners. I know a ton of dentists. I know a ton of physicians. And it just hurts my heart when you watch the news and people are acting out, if you will, and not doing the right thing right the first time. I don't have a big sign in front of me saying, get vaccinated. I'm an advocate. I'm fully vaccinated, including my booster, my family is. But it's about protecting your community. Again, back to the community. It's back to you as dental students future dentists, future providers of health care who are out there on the front lines doing the right thing, always right the first time. I need to call my good friend Marco Vojic at the ADA, who is the Vice President for Health Professionals Institute to find out, Health Policy Institute rather, the ADA, American Dental Association, to find out, do we have data yet to track how many dentists are leaving their profession because of the pandemic 
and because of the fact that they're having issues with the mandates, et cetera. I'm just curious to know because you need to be aware of these things too as clinicians to be who are out there very soon to be your D4s this coming year and your D3s in the next year. That's important, so important. So have any of you considered or uh, talked to your faculty members there who had, I know you guys, have been doing things virtually, have been in person doing clinical care, but during the pandemic, have you thought about your well-being? Have you thought about resilience of your faculty and yourselves, your classmates, your colleagues, your dean? Have you thought about asking them, how are you doing? How are you feeling? How is your day going? What can we do to help you? What can we do to make the world better for you? You know, it, it, it's, 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 it's the kind of thing that I worry about because as Brad will tell you, Dean Smith will tell you, I was liaison to the council dean. I was once a dean, as you know, and I worry about my colleagues. I still consider all the deans my friends and my colleagues, and I worry about them. There are deans who are retiring, there are deans that are resigning. There are new deans coming on board. And, you know, this is a challenge to Dell education. It's a major challenge to Dell education. Um, these are opportunities to explore individual and organizational interventions to combat burnout and loneliness and to enhance resilience amongst the faculty, students, and staff. I would hope that some of you have been thinking about this, you know, those who are in the student council, the student council leaders, the class leaders, because, you know, you, you need to look at yourself, first of all, and your, and your colleagues, but think about your faculty. Think about the administration at Midwestern. You know, to, to just say, hey, Dr. Dodell, how are you doing today, sir? How are you feeling? I mean, we've gone through a lot, you know, virtual curriculum, virtual lectures trying to come in and share clinical space. Someone's saying shut down for a few days because we got another problem with the, with the virus. Sometimes we, we're not selfish men and women, we're not. I know you're not. But think about that. Have you asked the question? Dean Smith, how you doing, sir? How you feeling? How's the family? Do things to enlighten their loads. Do things to brighten their days. Do things to brighten the days of your classmates. Do things to brighten the days of your patients. Do things to brighten the day of your faculty, the administrators, and staff. There's nothing harmful about that whatsoever. Again, it's about doing the right thing right always the first time. Because it's a problem right now. We're very concerned about burnout, loneliness, and resilience. Well-being is critical to your success as students, to their success as faculty, those responsible for teaching and educating you to become a healthcare provider. And I throw it in because, you know, as I read and I hear things about what's going on in society today. Uh, and I think, and I thank again, Dean Smith for asking me to do this. Um, you know, I, I don't I don't use PowerPoints. I have not used a PowerPoint now in the last two years because I've been all virtual. And when I see, and I wish I could see your faces today, and we just had a little hiccup, that's okay, I'm good. But more importantly, we're sharing information. And I mean, I'm just an individual who cares about people. That's the leadership in me. That's the mentoring in me. I share with you information that I think you need to hear and know. Uh, I, I read a lot and I stay abreast of the profession. Uh, I'm not gonna discuss AI with you today, artificial intelligence, so I'm quite sure you are well aware of what's going on with AI, and that's going to affect you. Digitization. I didn't grow up in a digital world when I was a Dell student, nor did Brad, okay, nor did David Dadell, nor did David Hancock. I mean, we just, this, this begins to happen over the years, now we're digitized. You know, uh, I can tell you a story that 
that happened. One of the schools I knew of had a uh, had a hacking experience, and the school was fully digital. And of course, digital went down. Everything went down. Service went down, and they still had to see patients. And the question was asked, well, I need an X-ray. Well, go downstairs and use the old tube head. And well, I develop. A, now you're going to the doctor and develop the X-ray. And I kind of chuckled, but you know, we think about do we have redundancy type systems to use if things go bad? Uh, when you have a patient who's now in, you know, your EHR and you no longer have access to his or her cell number or home number, and you're panicking because how do I communicate with the patient? I'm back in the clinics now. I need to get. They're back online, obviously, but these are things that happen. And, you know, I, I learned in the military, there are going to be times when <laughs> things happen and you have to have alternative ways of getting things done. And that's just my point. Even though we get caught up in the digitization process, uh, something goes down in terms of the servers or the digital stops working. And I share with you because I had to kind of laugh because you can see it coming. What's your backup plan? You know, when when I was in uniform, we always had alternate plans. Plan B, plan Z, and plan D. If something goes wrong, you go to plan F. And you say, okay, I think we can get this done now. So again, back to my point about unexpected things that can occur in a situation that can drive you just plain crazy, okay? Um, we've talked about leadership, ethics, mentorship, professionalism. I'm going to, when you talked about student faculty burnout, you know, well-being, resilience, and, and I just gave you a few pearls. Uh, I, I do a lecture also on the pearls of wisdom. Uh, I, we did that, and I caught now, when, when I was in dental school, my dean in 69 told all of us as freshmen, the five fingers of dentistry. And they include community support, advocacy, all right, competency, all right, being courteous, empathy. And I relabeled that the five fingers of healthcare providers. And you, you think about all those things, you know, being civically responsible means you're in the community involved, not just because you're a clinician providing health care, but you've got to be involved with the community. You talk about advocacy, I mean, you need to understand what should happen if you're in the House of Delegates for the ADA or the Arizona Delta Association, Delta Society, or Association, rather. You have to be able to advocate for the common good for your patients and your community and your patients. You know, being focused and having, you know, the, the courteous, the ability to to go into um, the Boy Scouts, the Girl Scouts, the YMCA, uh, a youth program where literally you can use your mentoring skills to motivate young men and women the way you are motivated. You talk about STEM. You talk about STEAM. The STEAM now is the big thing. I used to love when I was a dean getting folks who applied to the dental school who had degrees in the fine arts, music, non-traditional science majors who applied to dental school, of course they go through a little program to get their science courses to be eligible to apply to dental school. But I found them to be a lot more uh, analytical, more specific, able to seek things out. I, I remember myself as a student, I was totally involved in rope memory. You know, I could take great anatomy and kind of memorize it. Okay, duh. You say, what's wrong with him? And then you ask me a question the next day, I forgot. <laughs> okay? So the, the reality is uh, we, 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 we do things as men and women, and again, I've switched gears again, about advocacy. What are you doing to help the community of Phoenix, the community of Arizona, the community of where you're from? whether it's Maine, Montana, Texas, Florida, California, to promote, if you will, the STEM and STEAM subjects for young people. And I always focus on a lot of the folks in the underrepresented communities, our indigenous population, our African-American population, 
our Latino, Latinx population, our Asian American Pacific Island population. You know, we're all in this together. This is this is America. We're all in this together. And so one of the beautiful things I learned about my military experience, I was exposed to, oh my God, multiple cultures. I lived in the Far East. I spent time in the Middle East. I spent time in Europe. I spent time in North Africa. An opportunity to learn other cultures. And, you know, it makes you proud to be an American. But what my point is, when you're out professionally, and this is where we kind of roll into my DEI discussion, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, I'm not sure. I think your your dean, Dr. Smith, Brad Smith, has talked with you. Maybe he will soon if he hasn't already discussed. And that there's some individuals there who are called ambassadors for the ADEA, the American Dental Education Association Climate Survey. I'm supposed to be. I'm a, I'm a grand ambassador. They get one of these old guys, i.e., me, to go out and talk to deans and allied program directors about the advantage of this. This is about knowing about us in our profession as educators. Again, are we doing the right thing right always the first time? Are we exposing ourselves to the notion of diversity? And diversity is not about blacks, browns, Asian Americans, indigenous population. It's not about diversity, it's about cultures. It's about how we learn from each other. And you have a diverse institution. I'm going through the names here. Uh, on the participant list, and something I can't pronounce, but that's okay. But I can tell you, Dean Smith has a very diverse dental school at Midwest. And so that itself exposes you to different cultures. If I was king of the hill, I would encourage every young person to travel the world just to be exposed. I learned so much living in Asia. I've been to China. I've been to Singapore. I've been to Japan. I've been to Hong Kong. I've been to Europe. I had to spend a little time in Moscow, Russia, when I was a commander at DENCOM. I've been to North Africa. I've been to Central America, what we call MedRIPs, Honduras, El Salvador. I was exposed to cultures. I said, oh my God, this is so cool. This is an experience. The Scandinavian countries, Denmark, Sweden. Okay, I got our Canadian, our border, our members above the, you know, our coastal members of Mexico and Canada. Think about the world where we will be today if we just totally respected and understood everyone's culture. That's what diversity is. DEI is just not an acronym. It's about how we see the world from a cultural perspective. The E for equity. We talked about health disparity. We talked about quality of health care. You look at folks, and I'll say this to you guys, and you probably know this, but there are people in the African-American community who have been sort of like uh, anti-vaccination, all right, anti-vaccines, because of what? They remember the Tuskegee experience at Tuskegee, Alabama, the civic experience. They remember Henrietta Lacks, the woman in Baltimore, Maryland, that John Hopkins took her cells, and those cells are all over the world doing great and wonderful things. And they think that it's about someone trying to use them for a purpose. It's not the case. This is how we talk about equity and health disparities. I'm pretty sure when you see a patient, who has spread out pockets of more than six to eight millimeters in depth, and you see ginger totally recessed, and you may experience feet of earth, you got to think about diabetics or diabetes. And I hope that's part of your discussion when you talk to a patient. When you look at someone's intraoral cavity and you're examining the floor of the mouth, the bulky mucosa, you're looking at the oral pharyngeal area. And you see lesions, and it makes you think about, okay, do I get a biopsy here? Is this coming from another site within the body? 
you're talking about now, metastasis of cancer. This is why we do oral cancer screenings. Folks respect us for the fact that we can go into the upper core. I used to get so excited when I would get letters, and I'm quite sure Dr. Smith does also, Dean Smith, when I would get letters from patients who have just left a hygiene clinic who had their vital signs reviewed and had their blood pressure taken, and you get something like 157 over 120, and you go, whoa, something's wrong here. And you know what you do. You refer that patient out for a consultation, whether it's to an internal medicine, a cardiologist patient, whatever the case might be. Again, the collaboration between other health care providers and you and we, and I get letters saying, dear Dean, I am so happy that your students took my blood pressure this morning. I went over to the hospital and I discovered that I was getting ready to go into Stroke City. Okay? It's things like that that we know. Okay? And we'll get into comments about person centered care in a few minutes. But think about the patients you're seeing on a daily basis at your dental institute. Just think about it. Okay? And, 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 and when you're in the clinical experience, when you're out there in the community doing your thing, what you're learning and what you're being taught is so significant. Uh, I will tell you, and you probably already figured it out, I am a full proponent of primary care integration with total health care. I'm, I'm, I'm one of those proponents. I'm big on IPE. I'm big on IPEC in a professional education collaboration between the associations. There's now 22 of those associations to include our health science librarians. So everyone is on board in terms of IPE and how we focus on the person, the person, person-centered care, how we engage the mouth with the rest of the body or the rest of the body with the mouth. It's so important. We're just not from the neck up to the top of the head. We're concerned about the body from the top of the head all the way down to the toes. And that's what we're all about. You may be in those who become a dentist, but part of your profession is to become a great doctor who understands how to integrate oral health and total health. That's, that's the goal. That's the goal. And that's where we are today. That's where we are today. So we talked about D, diversity. We talked about E, equity, and not I, inclusion. You know, it, 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 inclusivity basically means, you know, diversity means, you know, you, you, you invite someone to your party, okay? Inclusion means they're now coming to your party and you're asking them to dance, okay? I mean, that's a simple way to put it, all right? And you think about DEI today. There's a lot of stuff on DEI that's all over the place. I mean, uh, if I was 25 years younger, I'd probably go out and get a, a degree in DEI. I don't know. But I can tell you the folks that I work with at ADIR, the Access, Diversity, and Inclusion Unit at ADIR, I can tell you they've done so many fantastic things. I'm quite sure hopefully all of you are ADIR members. Hopefully you belong to COSER, the Council of Students, Residents, and Fellows at a deer. Hopefully you're also an a deer member, which is free, and you take advantage of the a deer website to see what's on the website and to really enjoy what's being presented, not only for you as a student, but what's going on with stakeholders around the idea system, our allied colleagues, those who are dental assisting, dental hygiene, our dental therapists, of the laboratory technicians, to know what the family is exposed to. Again, that's the inclusion piece. Bring everybody together as a team, as a full family. And when there's a hiccup, a DIA tends to respond to it. Whether well, there's a situation of uh, George Floyd in Minnesota a couple years ago, or anyone else, uh, you know, Asian Pacific Islander who may have had some negative experience, we respond because 
it's part of their responsibility as educators to expose everyone to diversity, equity, and inclusion. And so we're engaged now in the climate survey, the Air Climate Survey. We have a national consultant, a reputable consultant, who will garner all the data, and hopefully by next September, the data will be collected and we'll have a conversation. It's not about right or wrong, good or bad. It's about information to share. And what can we do to improve, you know, our DEI, as you will, status within our institution? Everyone is very good at telling their story. And I think you as students, I know you folks are really engaged in social media and you're quick learners. You're very quick learners. And so I appreciate when I hear back from students about things that bother. And, you know, I got to tell you, I know DA Smith is going to talk to you about this. He may have already done so. So we have task force that's being developed now to look at the future of Dell education post-pandemic. I'm quite sure at Midwestern there's a discussion right now with Dean Smith and his faculty post-pandemic. How are we going to look? What are we going to do? How do we turn this into fully hybrid? Is it going to be totally virtual? Is it going to be a combination of both, the in-person? I think sometimes we get very comfortable sitting at home with our laptops and our iPads on the side of our bed, okay, looking at a lecture and learning, I hope. But more importantly, you know, there's certain things in dentistry you can't do Virtually, you just can't do it. Now, I would suspect one day, um, who knows, maybe there'll be a system out there where maybe AI will be part of this discussion where we can do things. I, I, I do remember the fact, uh, again, the story I told you earlier about the school that lost, that had been hacked, and the inability to take a digital impression and push a button, send it to the lab, well, <laughs> now you got to take the actual impression, duh. And you got to pour the model, you got to trim the dyes, and you got to send it to the lab. And you go, wait a second, I wasn't here to learn. I, I wasn't here. I'm not here to do that. But you got to always have a backup to the backup. And so uh, they're back online now. But those things do happen because we're in that digital, we're in that digital family now. We're in the digital learning, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm a boomer. You know, I'm 74 years of age, and so I, I've seen it all, but I try to stay as current as I can because I have two little granddaughters, one is six and one is eight, and I got to keep up with those little girls that just here for Thanksgiving. And they really, when you look at them managing their iPads and their phones, it freaks me out. It's scary. And so that's the world we live in today. Okay. Um, I've been talking now, uh, Dean Smith, for about uh, an, an hour. Um, I have a few more things I want to share with the students. Uh, is this a good time to allow the students to take maybe a break, Dr. Dodell? Yep, I think it would be fine to do that now. Um, you want to rejoin in maybe five or ten minutes? What would what would you do? Let's, let's do let's do a ten minute break. So right now it's twelve oh nine or twelve ten Eastern time, and it's uh, basically it's. I guess it's 10, 10, your time, mountain yeah. time. So we'll come back uh, in about 10 minutes. Sounds good. And I'll stay on, okay? Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Dodell. So, so Dr. Rouse, there's mm -hmm. actually someone who wants to say hi to you. Let me, let me see if I can turn her microphone on. Let me see okay. Um, let's see. You gotta find her in the list here of the hundred okay. students that are connected. How many students are on? Um tell you in a second. Let me let me get her connected first. Okay, you go ahead, please do. Matt Mahassan, can you hear us? I Hello? can hear you, yes. Yeah, we can hear you. You you can say hi. Okay. Hi, Dr. Rouse. Who is this? This is Mahassan Hengavai. Oh my uh, goodness. How are you? Three. How are you? You remember me? Yes, I remember you. No way. <laughs> Are you on the faculty now there? I am. I am. In which department? Um, I'm on the clinic, restorative department. I'm okay. A, a, a clinical faculty. 
Oh my goodness, refresh my memory. What year did you graduate? Oh, three. I graduated oh my goodness. in 03. My name you, was, um, you, graduated, was... you graduated the year I became the dean. Exactly. You graduated, <laughs> oh I graduated my God. when Dr. Sanders was the dean. You yes, were dean, Sanders, dean Sanders, yes. Oh, my God, Dr. Hagasee. Oh, my God. It is so good to hear your voice. It's I wish so I could good to you. hear you. I was so excited when I saw your name. And um, Dr. Dudel, is it just us or are we everybody? No, it's, it's, no, it's you and a couple hundred people. So <laughs> <laughs> I have a story to share with you, Dr. Rao. So I will tell you that uh, in private, but you um, did change my life. Well, thank you so very much. You know, I'm on LinkedIn and I'm on Twitter. I don't yes. do fa I don't I will do find you. Yeah, I don't do Facebook. Uh, but uh, my goodness, it is. You're. I'm just so happy to see you're there at Midwestern. Thank you. With Dr. Dodell and Dean Smith and all the students, I know you're doing a fantastic job. Oh my. Thank goodness. you. Thank you. It was so nice to um, hear from you too, Dr. Rouse. I hope everything well, is well. Thank you so very much for letting Dr. Dodell know you want to speak with me. Well, that's good. That's of course, good. I have to catch up. We'll catch up later. Right. Okay. So Leo right. was Leo was kind of a, a funny story. So um, Mahathan got a new ID badge, so she couldn't swipe into our systems, and that's kind of my job. Right. Oh, so she was here today because normally she works in one of our off-site clinics. Gotcha. And she walked in and she said, my office, while you were talking, and I was muted, obviously, and she goes, starts telling me that, oh, you were the dean, and et cetera. And, she, and I said, well, why don't you say hi? <laughs> I do that. I said, absolutely. When we get a break, you jump in so you can say hi. That is yeah. fantastic. Well, I tell you, it's so good to hear and it's good to know that, you know, you're out there engaged in teaching and learning. That is fantastic. Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you. We um, definitely had a great um, learning experience at Howard and prepared well, me that, well. That, that makes me that makes me proud, and I'm glad you're there sharing a the wealth with your colleagues and your and your students. That's fantastic. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Rouse. Oh well, thank you. My goodness, that's great. That's, so <laughs> that's much, 20 David. years ago. That's almost yeah, 20 that is, years. Hey, we're, we're aging each other. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> You're aging well. Sure. Well, thank you. Thank you yeah, so thank much. You, Dr. All right. Go ahead and mute me. Yep, I will. All right, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, uh, we're back and I had an opportunity to uh, talk with one of my former students who's a faculty member of yours out there at Midwestern, and I'm so happy to hear her. Uh, boy, I tell you, it is amazing. This has been just a ball. Uh, and I, again, I, I thank Dean Smith and Dr. Dodell for the privilege of, of being with you today. I, I wish we could be able to see each other, but uh, I think sometime in not too distant future, I need to come out there and visit the school and uh, spend some time with Dean Smith and Dr. Dodell and, and, and Mahasin. I mean, with one of my former alum. This is great. This is great. So let's let's go on. Let's a quick repeat. We, we've covered ethics. We covered leadership. We talked about mentorship, talked about professionalism, talked about health equity. We talked, talked about DEI, and we talked about student faculty burnout, and the resiliency, and well-being, and what, what you can do to support yourselves, your colleagues, your faculty, administrators, etc. And so uh, now I want to go into this uh, discussion of. Uh, person-centered care, and, and, uh, and I'm not trying to sell you anything. I'm talking about this from a point that's very important. Um, there's a very important article by one of my former colleagues, Dr. Anthony Pallotta, who was the chief learning officer at ATEA. He's now independent, consulted, working on his own, and he did the guest editorial for the November edition of the Journal of Dental Education. And I've known Anthony now, oh, God, it's a good seven, eight years now. And even then, when I left my deanship and went to Adir to be the senior scholar and resident, we talked about the person-centered approach to transforming dental education. And again, it's this 
his way, and, and, and I'm a full believer in this because I've been involved in this IPE discussion for a long time, as well as your dean, Brad Smith. You know, we, we historically, colleagues, in 1926, Dr. William Guise wrote a wonderful book, and it was on health education. And some of you may know Dr. Guys, know the name at least, Guys. And during that time, if you didn't know the history, dentistry was part of medicine. And one of the things that, that I talk about today with my colleagues is one of the things that Dr. Guys did not do, he did not talk about the integration of oral health and total health. He didn't do that. We just said, okay, dentistry is dentistry, medicine is medicine. And if you get a chance, if you love to read, know about history of healthcare, read the Flexner Report, okay, which is all about medicine, medical schools. But when you get a chance, do Google, and it's about 499 pages. Read the, the book by Bill Guys about healthcare. And so, I think about this every day now, that if I was then in 26 with Dr. Guys, who was by way a biochemist, not a dentist or a physician, he was a biochemist at Columbia University, I would be talking about how do we make sure that the two professions are blended, okay, and not separate. And so one of the things that uh, Dr. Pallotta did, Anthony Pallotta, is he talked about the concept of person-centered, the care model. And the goal was to focus beyond the disease, but to the whole person. And again, it's about the whole person. You know, someone comes in, and, 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 and he said it earlier, they have a diabetic, and they have, and it's, it's great. So a quick story. I think many of you may know that Western University is not too far from you all in Arizona. It's in Pomona, California. And the dean is like Dean Brad Smith. Dean Fittigson is a good friend of mine. And I remember doing the commencement there a few years ago. Uh, we did a combined commencement address to pharmacy and dentistry. And I was impressed that there were nine health science schools at Western, totally lockstep into IPE. And I learned about the fact that, you know, osteopathic health systems, that's how they work, that's how they think, that's how they plan to make sure we optimize health care. And I was there to visit, and this is a true story. I'm over in their primary care clinic, which also housed the dental clinic, one of the dental clinics. And I'm in the podiatry clinic, and a P3, a third year podiatry student, had just examined a patient who was really out of control with his diabetes, and he had foot ulcers and uh, et cetera. And when he finished the exam, he said, okay, now, Mr. So-and-so, I need you to go up to the second floor to see the dentist about your gum disease. And I said, and I was in the back of the room with the dean, and I said, wow. And they looked around and said, who's that? Well, I said, that was, that was Dean Rouse from Howard. I was also at the same time the deputy provost for health affairs at Howard. And I was just in awe. So then I went over to the school, and they had a whole section where the students from all healthcare disciplines basically were learning together. Uh, the same thing was being done up at, 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 at the Minnesota when I was on the committee up there promoting uh, in professional education and collaboration. It was funny. So all these experiences that I've had sort of hones in on why I'm sharing this with you. And I think many of you have heard from your dean and your faculty about the social determinants of health. The social determinants of health. Uh, these are conditions in which people are born, grow, work, live, and age in. And, and these forces and systems shape their daily lives, the economics, 
the community you live in, you know, the, the whole nine, nine yards. And the World Health Organization, WHO, has indicated that they know that the social determinants of health account for more than 70% of health outcomes, more than 70%. And that includes oral health outcomes. Think about that. So one of our goals is to change the mindset from disease-centric to person-centric. And so what we got to do is try to help reshape the future of oral health providers socialized in the profession to change that concept. Uh, I know many of you are aware of the Harvard School of Dental Medicine, uh, Harvard School of Dental Medicine, and Dean Smith knows Dr. Bruce Donoff, Dean Donoff, Dean Emeritus Donoff, former dean of Harvard. We're all very good friends. And I remember Dean Donoff invited me up after we did the expert panel in 2009 to speak to the students in the public health community school there. And it was a Joe Henry fellowship. Joe Henry was my dean at Howard. And he left Howard and went to Harvard as an interim dean and became the chair of Perio. But that's not the story. The point is, Dean Donoff's point was, I'm going to push the concept of oral physician. And I thought about that. I said, oh, my goodness, oral physician, that's going to really create a problem. He says, well, you think about the history of our professions, medicine and dentistry, when we were basically combined and then sort of separated. And now we're talking about primary care and oral health care integration. A lot of this is being pushed by our nurse practitioner colleagues. Uh, I know Dee Smith knows this. Uh, years back, you know, in, in the late two, early two, mid 2000s, uh, Dean Emeritus Mike Alfano, who was a dean at New York University's Dental School, he and Dean Judith Haver, Dr. Haver and Dr. Alfano, decided to combine the dental and nursing school, which they did. And it was a first push at developing this interprofessional education model. And sort of the model that was developed out at Weston, where you had these nine health science schools, fully integrated, fully lockstep on total health care, of which a component was oral health care. And even to this day, Dean Haver, Judith Haver, Dean Haver, Dr. Haver, who's a good friend of mine, uh, she is still very active. And some of you, if you do a lot of reading or you do a lot of Googling about oral health and IPE, you will probably see a lot of papers that are being published by nurse practitioners related to oral health in nursing and nurse practitioners. I mean, it's, it's like, it's, it, it's so cool when you read about the things that they have been doing uh, to advocate. This is why I made a comment earlier about the North Dakota, North Dakota Medical School inviting dentists up to get experience with primary care. Now, that's their objective to try to show that we're working fully with the oral health team and the other total health team, which we're all part of, and that's important. Okay? So I share that with you because it's a term that some of you will be carrying the mail, and don't get me wrong, I'm not a politician, but I do get a little emotional when it comes to the fact that one of the core competencies of IPEC, or ITE, was to improve interprofessional communication and collaboration. That was one of the core competencies. How do we work together, think together? I'll share with you a quick story. I'm not sure what the Dean Smith is talking about. I don't know if you faculty, but one of the outcomes, one of the outcomes of the pandemic, particularly in emergency rooms, in emergency departments around the country and hospitals, we were trying to, because, you know, folks would go to the emergency room at 3 o'clock in the morning with an odontogenic lesion. And they may 
wound up doing what? An MRI or a CAT scan just to see what the bill is. Instead of calling one of you or one of us, a dentist to say, patient has pain, lower left quadrant, looks like a tooth. I mean, I know the tooth number, but it could be number 29. And they're doing a CAT scan. Duh, give me a break. And so during the pandemic, they were seeing a lot more emergency dental patients with odontogenic issues because a lot of the dental practices were closed and some of the schools may have been closed too during that time. Here's my point. So now the ED physicians are heavy into understanding oral health care and oral health diseases and diseases of the mouth. So an offshot of the pandemic is that it has opened the eyes of a lot of our colleagues in the healthcare business to say, oh my God, should have been paying attention to this a long time ago. And I recall that I gave a presentation at University of Missouri, Kansas City, a few years back, I was on a panel with pharmacists, social worker, nurse practitioners, and physicians. And in the audience was an anesthesiology resident. And he asked a question during the Q&A time. He says, well, you know, well, Dr. Rouse, you know, why should I worry about, you know, someone with Del decay? I said, excuse me, I was in a residency where I took anesthesia and anesthesiology training. And I can tell you, when you're up at 0 dark 30 or 6.30 in the morning or 4 o'clock in the morning or 5.30 in the morning, you're going to intubate patients for a procedure for one of the surgeons. And while you're doing that, that tube is going into the oral pharyngeal area. And what do you see? Do you look? I mean, you're going to pass teeth. You're going to pass bleeding guns. You're going to pass probably some pathology. And you have a responsibility when you extubate that patient to say, hey, I know some great dental students over at Midwestern University. I'm going to be afraid over there to get this work done. That's what we're talking about. We're not talking about taking power away from you or power away from us. We're talking about how do we collaborate to make sure that the patient gets the optimal care, the person-centered care that he or she deserves. And he, afterwards, he came to me, he thanked me, said, I didn't think about that. I said, well, no problem. Pediatricians were the first medical specialists, specialties to introduce oral health into their American Academy of Pediatrics meeting in Boston. I was there. And I remember it was an aha moment because they were now paying attention post Diamante drivers. The young man we discussed earlier, a 12-year-old African-American male in Maryland who died of a brain abscess, secondary to her carious lesion. And we had a great conversation. So what do they do now? Every resident in pediatrics, boom, they go to a complete oral health curriculum, part of their training. Why? Because it's the right thing to do always the first time. If we're interested in someone's diabetic foot that has ulcers, we should understand the end result could be advanced periodontal disease. This is about person-centered care. How do we focus on the person? And I know you folks at uh, Midwest and get that. It's all part of the critical thinking process. But I bring it up because I need for you to do a lot more reading about it if you haven't done so already. I know you're introduced to it. But think about it. And do get a chance to take a look at that Journal of Dental Education article published by Adir, November of this year, Dr. Anthony Pallotta, guest editorial. Very important point. So we know, even though Dr. Satcher told us in 2000, if you have not read the Satcher book on oral health in America, I, I, I encourage you to do so. Google it, read it, et cetera, because David Satcher, former Surgeon General, said, Oral health is integral to total health. He said it. And then seven years later, what happened? A 12-year-old died from dental disease, secondary brain abscess, okay? These are not 
made up story. You can't make this stuff up. This is real stuff, colleagues, okay? And so this is the world you're going to be living in. So I'm going to make a, another statement here, which I, I want to make this important. To prevent any health risk originating from poor oral health, to prevent any health risk originating from poor oral health, and to improve overall health and well-being, to improve overall health and well-being, a person-centered care approach that integrates a person-centered care approach that integrates oral health into overall health must be a critical, must be a critical element in both care design and delivery. I'm referring to history taken, oral medical history taken, treatment planning, etc. It is so important. And these new terms are not, I mean, these terms are not really new terms. They've been out here for a long time, but I do become a student of person-centered healthcare. Do make that reality. If you get a chance, Google some of the Harvard School of Dental Medicine, primary care, and oral health care scenario. I'm participating in many of their webinars over the last two years during the pandemic. Uh, you will find yourselves really being inspired. And truly, you're all doctors. I did a webinar for Las Vegas last February, this past February. And one of the students in the Q&A section asked me a question, and, and she said, um, why do people think that we're technicians? I said, it's a good question. And I said, what are your thoughts on that? And our response was, well, I am a doctor. I'm, a, I'm in training to become a doctor of dental surgery. I said, yes, you are. I said, and what you do to prevent those kinds of comments where you allow others to assume because you do veneers, you do implants, you do class twos, class threes, class fours, whatever the case might be, you have to become an advocate for what the profession is all about. We're about total health care delivery that's fully integrated. So if you ask my personal opinion colleague, I would say, I'm one of those supporters of the change to say we are oral physicians. I'm not saying we're under the medical family. I just use that term because people, another thing I would tell you, I know Dean Smith says all the time, whenever I hear someone say doctors and dentists, please correct them. There are physicians and dentists. We're both doctors, okay? And if you want to tick Rouse off, this day my presence and said, there's a doctor and there's a dentist. Duh. I kind of go into a complete discussion about the fact that we're all healthcare providers. The correct title for him is, or her is physician. The correct title for us is dentist. We're both doctors. We have advanced degrees, advanced training, et cetera. And that's my way of protecting the profession because I told a young lady at Las Vegas, I said, don't ever be shy about correcting someone at that moment. That's what we do. That's about learning. It's about teaching. I'm always in a teaching mode. Brad will tell you that. These people will tell you that. I, I stay in a teaching mode all the time. And as I get older, my wife keeps saying to me, says, you know, you become an honorary also. I said, no, it's about protecting my profession. I love this profession. And I want to see these young folks who are future leaders in this profession. I use the term legacy. I used to tell my graduates, I want you to do what I do today much better than me. That's legacy. I'm not the end all of success. I may be doing a presentation, but I'm quite sure a lot of you will be doing the same presentation several years from now or 20 years from now, or 30 years from now, having a conversation about the value of person-centered care. 
Ladies and gentlemen, it's now 12.44 my time. It looks like it's 10.44 your time. Uh, I think I will stop here now, Dr. Dodell. I want to make a final comment before I do that. Uh, I want to make two quick points, and, and, and I'm very proud of this. Make a monumental difference in society. That's my point, or Ralph's point to you. Make a monumental difference in society. And you heard me say it earlier today, do the right thing, always right the first time. And ladies and gentlemen, the future of this profession is in your hands. Thank you so very much for the opportunity to serve and to be with you today, uh, it's been a hoot. Uh, thank you, Dr. Dudell, for what you've done to get me ready for this. Thank you, Dean Brad Smith, for the opportunity to be a part of this very important session. I do hope that you've learned something, ladies and gentlemen. I guess we can go into a Q&A now, David, if that's be quiet. Yeah, let me uh, open it up uh, while the, it's open. Um, did anyone have any questions for Dr. Rouse? If you want to write in the Q&A uh, or, or if you want, um, just raise your hand and I will open up your microphone and we can do it that way so you can ask individually. Let me see if anyone's raising their hand. Don't be shy, colleagues. I'm also a former faculty member and I see your names in the participant list. And I'm not shy about calling on someone. If that's okay, Dean Smith. Let me get let me get Brad's mic on. Hold on one second. Brad, you're you're I love it. I call on people, I call all, people all the time. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I'm gonna call on, on on student Dr. John Francis. Is he one of your students? Uh he's actually one of our faculty. Oh, I'm sorry. All oh, right, I'll leave him alone. <laughs> I, you can pick on him. I don't care. Go ahead. I'm sorry, Dave. No, I would say you could pick on John, but go ahead, pick a student. All okay. right. How about uh, student Dr. Josh France? Josh France. Let me find him. Josh. Here he is. Hey, Josh, you're you're live, so you've been picked on. So, Josh, it's nice to meet you. What year are you, Josh? Josh, are you a D three or D four or D two? Josh, can you hear me? Yeah, yes. I can hear you. Yes. Josh, 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 you keep muting and unmuting yourself. Let me do it, and and okay, Josh, you're unmuted, so go ahead and just talk. All right, I'm a fourth year student. Thank you, Josh. Congratulations to you. Thank you. What's your question, Josh? I'm going to ask you a question, Josh. So what are the takeaways for you, Josh? You're getting ready to graduate here, you know, next May. Uh, what's your takeaway, Josh, from the presentation? Josh, did you hear the question? I'm putting you on the spot, Josh. Just give me one of your takeaways. Now talk to me, Josh, about the value of the mentor mentee uh, that you were engaged in as a D4 with your D3 colleague. David, is he having a hard time? No, he's a, he's a, he's unmuted. Okay. You still there, Josh? And then his microphone disappeared. No, no, he's still there. Can you hear me okay, Josh? They want us maybe talk to right, well, let's go, let's go to uh, is, is student Dr. Kathy Lee. Uh, Kathy? Okay. okay, I've unmuted you, Kathy. 
Hello, Kathy. How are you? Are you a D2, a D3, D4? She's unmuted. Okay, I see that, yeah. Are you there, Kathy? Yeah, we're obviously having a problem with the uh, communications here, David. Yeah, I heard both of them respond initially, and then they kind of both went out. Yeah. And Kathy's back on mute again. Yeah, I, mu I muted her. Um, okay. Let's see if there's any, nobody, anyone raising. Oh, wait a minute. Some people, someone raised their hand here. Hold on. We've got a lot. Okay, great. Gregory, you're, you're unmuted. Go ahead. Can you hear me? Yeah. I can hear you very well, Gregory. Okay, thank you. Uh, first off, thank you for talking with us today, um, Dr. Rouse. Um, I thought the, the quote from MLK was interesting about the inequalities, and I'll have to do some research about that. Um, but going into the Navy afterwards, after school here, what made you want to stay in for 28 years? And um, wow. I know uh, it's kind that's, of that's, pointing that's down to the military, but you yeah. know, how how did you and if you were, you know, your spouse deal with, you know, the moves and all the stress? Of okay. That? Well, well, you know, Gregory, first of all. Uh, thank you for your service, and thank you for being part of the Navy. My dad was in the Navy. He's a World War II vet. God bless his soul. But I can tell you now, during my experience in the military, it actually it was a joint decision between my spouse and I. I was a ROTC graduate in 1969. I was commissioned. And uh, I chose to go into the Army Dental Corps primarily because I had some fantastic mentors who literally convinced me while I was in dental school. They were some retired colonels in Air Force, Navy, and one Army. And I also had some retired Tuskegee Airmen back in the day when I was in dental school. But I chose the military because I was excited about the opportunity to work in a multidisciplinary, a multidisciplinary environment. And I can tell you from my Navy colleagues, I have many Navy colleagues. In fact, uh, one of my dearest friends is Sean Meeham, who was the former director of the Navy Postgrad College out in Bethesda, Maryland. And uh, the new dean at West Virginia University is, uh, is, is Stephen, who is uh, a retired admiral, one star. So I, I Petuta, Stephen Petuta. But for my family, it was exciting because I enjoyed the opportunity to move around the world. You know, you're going to do some ship duty six months out on the, you know, on the fleet somewhere doing your thing. But it was the camaraderie, Greg, that I enjoyed. It was the opportunity to get advanced training. It was the opportunity to be global, to go around the world. I lived all over the world. And it was cool, particularly when I was DINCOM commander. And when I was DINCOM commander, I got to tell you, I was responsible for 4,000 people with a $350 million budget. And I had seven subordinate commands around the globe. And that was a two-year command. And it was just fantastic to work with dentists in South Korea, to work with dentists in Europe. Uh, I got some dear friends in Germany, some great friends in the UK, uh, in Italy. And so my wife and my son thoroughly enjoyed the opportunity. In fact, my wife misses the military more than I do. But you will find it to be very rewarding. Are you an HPSB student, by the way? I am, yes, sir. Fantastic. Uh, so you, you, you're, you're basically leaving middle school. Hopefully, uh, I hate to say it to all your colleagues, but you're leaving middle school basically debt free, and you have a commitment. And do you plan to specialize? I do not. I'm actually going to be. I found out this week in Bethesda next year for the GPR program. Man, fantastic! Reason. It's a great program. In fact, uh, Sean will be retiring this summer, so you may get to see him before he leaves, you know, Bethesda. But what an opportunity that is. It's a phenomenal program. It's a very important program. It's a, you know, everything in the military now, Greg, is joint, joint everything. So you're going to 
Walter Reed, which is a joint assignment. The Naval Post Grand Dental Co is a joint assignment. So you'll be there with colleagues from the Army, the Army, Air Force, and so forth, and maybe even public health service, all right? And maybe a few Marines, but uh, I wish you well. What are your other questions about that? I mean, my family enjoyed the military. I think um, also, you know, I heard that as you kind of grow in the Army or in the Dental Corps, that you do less and less dentistry. Um, you know, is that something that you found difficult in your time in there, or did you kind of enjoy the more leadership aspect of well, the Army? That's, that's an excellent question, Greg. I can tell you two things. One of the things, I got my experience to be in dental education from being in the Army. I spent five years at the what we call the Army Medical Department Center and School. So everyone with a healthcare discipline came through the school. I had the fortune of being the chair of the Department of Dentistry at the AMED Center of the School, which gave me, you know, as a faculty member in the military, it's a different process. But I learned how to do curriculum, test writing, examinations, programs of instruction. And so for my first 10 years, I was a full board clinician after my residency. I did a residency in comprehensive dentistry, two-year residency, with a secondary in prosthodontics. And so when I left my residency, I went to Fort Devens in Massachusetts, where I was the prosthodontist for two and a half, three years. So then I went back to San Antonio to the schoolhouse, where I was on the faculty for five years, and I got what's called a faculty designation. And I got my interest in dentistry from an educational perspective. I taught the hygiene course in the Army, the two-year program there. Uh, and so I was forced, and then when I got out of the schoolhouse and went to my other commands, uh, my alma mater called me and said, I need a clinical dean, can you come back? And so I, I retired and I went back to uh, uh, Howard and the rest of history. So I've been blessed to have the experience of both clinical training and academic training while in uniform. To answer your question, Greg? It did. Thank you very much. I really you, appreciate you, it. You all up you, you all up with that, sir. Thank you for your question. Thank you. You're welcome, sir. Any Thank other you. questions, David? Yeah, um actually um Josh who you tried to talk to before uh, just message me another way and says he thinks he fixed his microphone, so we're going to turn it back on. Josh, you're, you hear us now? Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Josh, sorry. I can hear you, Josh. Yes, I can hear you very well, Josh. All right. Um, I know previously you'd asked me about the D3, D4 mentorship. So I was just yes, sir. A little bit. Um, I mean, I know, granted, it's the only experience that I have in dental school. So, you know, when you talk to a lot of people who don't have that or other schools that don't do that, I guess it's, it, it's more unique than we probably realize. But with that being said, I think it's uh, I think it's kind of monumental because for me coming in as a as a D3, the faculty there they really try to make you lean on the fourth year when you first come to clinic, and they they try to get you guys to figure everything out and take responsibility for certain things. But I will say over the last year, um, or the last however many months it is since uh, the D3s have come over and we've moved up to D4s, it's kind of forced you to have the I take more responsibility than you probably want to because you have to have those difficult conversations with patients or what, whatever it is and make sure your things are in order uh, a lot more than you did the year before and you kind of don't have a choice. So I've, I think that's probably the most impactful part of it, if that answers that question for you. Yes, sir, it does. And thank you very much, Josh, for responding because I got to tell you, your program is a unique program. And as you suggest, you're going to leave there with a ton of experience in managing, working with, and facilitating responsibility as a leader. What is your plan when you leave the school next this next summer? Um, so I'm actually in the middle of working out a opportunity that I have here locally in Surprise, Sun City area. Okay. Um, it's a single doctor office, and he's asked me to come on. He wants to expand, and he has basically room, and he's looked out enough to where he can support another doctor. And so that's good for me because my family's here, my wife's family's here, and I get to stay local. So. That is fantastic. So you're going to be trusted into leadership. 
yes, and I'm learning at, at uh, Midwestern. So congratulations to you, Josh. And thank, thank you for your response. I appreciate that. Very good. Thank you, Josh. Good luck to you too, Josh. Any thank other you. questions? Let me see uh, if anyone else raised their hand. I did see someone else's hand earlier, but they put, put it back down. Um, anything anyone else would like to say something, just raise your hand. Let me just check the Q&A area. Make sure, oh, wait, someone did put in the Q&A. Hold on. You raise that. Uh, that was, uh, can't hear Josh. Okay. Okay. It was just, everyone making, was making, picking on Josh saying we can't hear him. So that was the only thing. <laughs> no problem. We got, we got that working. Anyone else you want to talk to, Dr. Rouse? How about Lauren Ashendorf? Is she on the faculty or is she a student? She is a student. Let me unmute her. Lauren? Lauren? Uh, so, Leo, I would pick someone whose name does not have an exclamation mark next to them. Okay. I'm trying to find another young lady here. Uh, how about uh, how about Michelle Dutton? Michelle Dutton. Yep. I know Michelle well. She's her operatory is right next to my office. There she goes. Okay, Michelle. Michelle. Turn back to me. Can you hear me? Yeah. Now yeah, we can. Michelle, we can hear you, Michelle. Hi. Hi, Michelle. What year are you, Michelle? I'm a fourth year. Fantastic. And so. Uh, I won't ask you what I asked Josh, but uh, what are your plans when you leave Midwestern? Um, I am currently looking for jobs on the East Coast. Okay. Um, yeah. Either private or DSO. I'm open to both. Okay. Okay. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. And how are you enjoying your experiences out there, Midwestern? Uh, I think it's been great. Um, I agree with Josh. I think that this is a really unique opportunity that Midwestern gives us, and um, I personally loved the fact that, like, my partner came in fresh off of, like, a lot of dental classes, and she's been able to remind me about a lot of stuff I haven't thought about for the last year. So you've truly been involved as Josh as a mentor, which is just phenomenal. That is just fantastic. And I do hope that you're a D3 partner when she becomes a D4 when you graduate, that she does the same thing. I think the program you guys are participating in is just fantastic. And it goes to the fact that, you know, it's it's about leadership. It's about responsibility. Uh, you are learning that very well because you basically you're responsible for that D3 and uh, the patient continuity of care as you lead and move on to wherever you're going to go on the East Coast. So I really commend you all, and I really want to say to uh, Dean Smith, this is just one. I love this program that you have there at Midwestern. Uh, any takeaways from you from this particular discussion today? Uh, I actually had a question for you. Yes, ma'am. Um, how do you think you grew in the first few months out of dental school? Oh, what a fantastic Good question. So when I left dental school, I was at Walter Reed uh, in 1973. As you say, back in the day, Walter Wonderful. And I was around a bunch of great colonels who were all specialists. And I was thrust into this program, which was basically – we didn't call it an AGD GPR at the time, but it was basically like an internship. And I got to tell you, one great experience that I had, Michelle, at that time in 73, one of the things that all the department chairs did at Walter Reed, they had the blessing and the fortunate opportunity to examine Mamie Eisenhower. And that weekend, I was the dental officer on call, and I got a call from Colonel Bill Leffler at the time. He's retired now. He's deceased. And he says, uh, Captain Rouse, I need you to come down to the main center because we have something for you to do. And I go in, and I identify with I saw our media. I said, oh, God, this is, this is Eisenhower. All the department chairs would come in to examine Mrs. Eisenhower. And at the time, Colonel Leffler, who now retired General Leffler, was the department chair, and he says, do you think I have to, to actually examine Mamie Eisenhower? That is indelibly marked in my heart forever. Uh, 
1973. It was a blessing. I was one paranoid, scared to death young Army officer. But it gave me an opportunity to learn about how do you work with a dignitary? I mean, he used to spouse the widow of a, a former five star general officer and a former president. It was fun. And so, yeah, I had a great experience my first few months out of dental school in the Army. I learned a lot. I learned about people, I learned about myself. I learned not to be selfish. I saw an opportunity because I had great mentors who would, you know, I used to always say, well, you guys have been in the Army for 15, 20, almost 30 years. Why did you stay in? And that was one of the reasons why I stayed in. So uh, interesting enough, uh, one of my mentors was Colonel Bernie Whitsitt, who was deceased, but uh, he and his wife, Doran, invited my spouse and I over to his home. And he gave me all the reasons why I should stay in the Army as a career dental officer. And it was during the end of Vietnam. There were a lot of dentists who were, you know, leaving uh, the military, and they needed to have more dentists coming in. So I was blessed to have great mentors during that time, Michelle. Thanks for your question. Yeah, thank you. And good luck to you. Thanks so much. You're very welcome. Any other questions, David? Um, don't let me see if there's any hands up. I know it's, I know it's past the hour, uh, Brad, the two hour mark you gave me, but uh, I'll take one more if I can. If that's okay with you, David. Or... No, it's fine with me. I'm not going anyplace. Um, I don't see anyone hands raised, so you may just have to uh, challenge someone. Well, I, I want to. Uh... <laughs> I don't want to challenge her. I, I hope she's still on. Uh, Let me see. Someone just, I think, maybe raised their hand. Hold on. Sort of, oh, yep. Someone raised their hand. Hold on. Okay. All right. We have a volunteer, so we don't have to go through that. Okay. Hello, Michael. How are you? What Good. Year are How are you? you? I'm doing fine, sir. Good. What would you do different at the beginning of your career? With all what the knowledge. What would I yep. do different at the beginning of my career? I can tell you. Uh, and that's a good question, Michael. I have to be honest with you. Um, I'm not really certain what I would do different. I've had so many wonderful opportunities, but I will say this to you. I have never experienced private practice. And if I could, I would have probably tried to do some moonlighting back in those days to get the feel for a practice environment. I was practicing basically in the military, so I'm at Walter Reed, all right? So that's what I would probably want to do differently if I was all over again, just to give it a shot, see what I would really like it. Uh, I had some great, such, such great mentors uh, who had never participated in private practice. They were all military members. And so I got to tag along with them. And so I got this passion about the military. So it was back to, you know, the question that uh, I asked earlier of my colleague going into the Navy. So, yeah. Does that answer your question, Mike? Sure does. Thank you. Thank you. So what are you going to do next, Michael? Um, I'll be going into general dentistry looking for a private office or a DSO to start. Well, good for you. And at DSOs, let me say this about DSOs. Uh, I know about Heartland, I know about Pacific, I know about Aspen. One of the things I do appreciate about DSOs is that they're now they're doing a more integration with person-centered care, so they're kind of gravitating with some medical people now, et cetera. So I like that concept. But do go and have a good time, and the things that you've learned at Midwestern, utilize every tool that you use to provide quality, optimal, person-centered dental or health care, okay? Thank you. You're welcome, Michael. Okay. Let's see if anyone else, I think anyone else raised their hand. Nope, nobody else. Okay. Well, I got to tell you, uh, David, I thank you. I thank your student body. You've got some great students' representation that's been really good. Uh, one of the things I've learned is that. Uh, the mentor-mentee scenario works very well out there at Midwestern. And so I, I commend 
my dear buddy, old Russ Kilpatrick, and now, of course, Brad Smith, keeping that program going. Uh, it's fantastic. It's great. So, Brad, I'm going to give you, sir, opportunity to do your thing, and then uh, I got to tell you, this has been a hoot. I've, I've enjoyed this. Well, Leo, I wanted to thank you for taking the time. I, I also want to thank the students. I'm really, really proud of the students. They work so hard. They are so patient-centered. I get uh, maybe five or 600 responses from a survey that we use every month, and they always compare our students with outside dentists. One of the things that they talk about on a regular basis is their empathy and compassion. We have a, a older patient base and a lot of them look at our students as their kids or grandkids or great grandkids in some aspects and they really appreciate their care and their willingness to work with them. They're, it's exciting to work with dental students. But I'm really appreciative of the time that you've taken, the preparation that you've taken in your whole life because the stories that you tell are worth more than a PowerPoint presentation. And I don't think we could do anything to really pay you back for the wisdom that you've imparted today. So I just want to say thank you. Yeah. Well, Brad, again, to you, dear friend, thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, I enjoy doing this. Uh, I'll be doing uh, several more over the next several months after the first year. Uh, opportunities to share experience with students is very important to me, as you well know, Brad. And you know, I've learned over the years that, you know, I've had some fantastic mentors. Uh, one of the things that uh, I will share with you that I learned from General Powell to all who are on this call, and I was in the Army War College back in 1993, <laughs> General Powell said to us as a class, he said, ladies and gentlemen, if it's not broken, break it. And what he meant for, what he meant was, you must be a transformative agent. You must be a change agent. If you've been doing it the same way for the last 35, 40, 50 years, you are now impeding the success of how we make things different in our world. And I'll never forget that as long as I live. And then, of course, Mahatma Gandhi, his famous expression is, you must become the change you want to see. And I fully believe in that. And so I'm all pro for diversity, equity, and inclusion. I'm all for person-centered care. I'm all for the fact that now I know that your school is very involved in a D3, D4 mentor-mentee project. I think that's fantastic. That's fantastic. Thank you so much, Brad. All right, David, it's all yours. Okay. Stopping the recording. And...